scaled up to five times. And there's only a handful of wells that have been sampled more than five times. There's maybe one well that's been sampled up to 13 times within the last six years. So again, this illustrates that most of the sampling occurred early on and it was scaled back after 2005 to just include a subset of wells. The results of the sampling between 2003 and 2009, uh, there are about 138 wells that have been sampled. And this pie diagram kind of shows the distribution of the, of the results for arsenic and uranium. And as you can see, about 20% of the wells have come back below the MCLs of the both constituents. So there's been, there's been about 80% of the wells have been above the MCLs. The arsenic is more prevalent. There's been 59 wells plus uh, 23 wells, so about, about 82 wells that have exceeded the, the arsenic. And for uranium, there's been, there's been about 50 wells, uh, 27 plus, plus 23. So, you, so the arsenic is more predominant, the uranium is less predominant. I think that's pretty typical in the West. We also plotted on a map the results from 2003 to 2009, and this basically just shows if where the wells are that exceed the uranium, that's in green, and where the wells are that exceed the arsenic, and that's in brown. And if it's a green triangle, that's both uranium and arsenic. And this kind of shows that arsenic is kind of spread. This is the mine site here, but it's the evaporation ponds moving to the north. And arsenic kind of occurs from south to north, where the uranium is more concentrated to the north of the mine site. That's not always the case, but it's just kind of a general outcome that we see uh, based on the sand. And there's a larger figure as one of the uh, poster boards over here as well. The other thing that we did is we tried to look at how the concentrations change with time. And as the prior uh, presentation mentioned, there can be a lot of changes within a one year period due to seasonal effects, pumping. And basically on the Y axis, we have the concentration of uranium, and on the x-axis we have time. This is from the beginning of the domestic sampling program through 2009. And again, not all wells have been sampled continuously through that period, so we just picked the ones that have got a pretty good history of sampling to show you. And as you can see, this, this initial set of sampling that occurred frequently, the concentrations jumped up and down quite a bit. And in this first slide, this first chart, it, it went from 30 to 50, back down to 40, up to 50, back down to 32 or so. It just jumps around. And the MCL, again, is 30 across here. So these are all fluctuating above the MCL. Whereas this chart, they fluctuated above and below the MCL. The MCL is right across here at 30. And you can see that the concentrations very both below and above the MCL with time. Now in terms of the long-term trend, it's more difficult to tell if the wells are increasing over time or, or decreasing. There's a lot of variables that can affect the data. Um, how the wells are constructed is a, is a big issue. Um, these domestic wells are not constructed the same as a monitoring well. They're meant to produce water for your home. So in so a lot of cases, they would Bring the well over a long um, interval and aquifer, they might have put gravel pack over the even longer interval to get better yield. So that's why it's kind of difficult to use the domestic wells as an indicator of, of long-term trends. And again, I have a lot of charts over here on the side that have more of the well shown concentration versus time. But the key thing again is to, is to say that if we just sampled the well once a year, we would probably miss a lot of this fluctuation. 
So we think that it's pretty important to sample more often, um, certainly to capture what's really going on. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Dave, and he's going to talk about some recommendations for improving the sampling program. Thank you, Dave. Well, uh, as, as Victor described, taking a good look at the data leads us to this conclusion that really the monitoring program is not that good as it exists. We need to monitor as well more frequently. And, you know, we've seen instances from the latest round of monitoring where our value was low four or five years ago, and now it's above the NCL, and the well wasn't sampled in that intervening period. So we think it's important to capture um, these fluctuations we see, but also the reason we're using this domestic well data is for different purposes. The monitoring well data is to try to understand the overall science of how ground water flows. So we're using this data to determine whether or not wells are above the MCL and whether or not some kind of response action is required. So we use it for different purposes. And so whereas in some cases it might be okay to sample a monitoring well that is Frequency, we don't think that's true for domestic wells. Uh, we think the program could also be improved by analyzing the samples for a consistent list of analytes. And analytes just means the chemicals. A lot of you are receiving reports from us and this the contaminants, chemicals, most of the metals, and is the level that was found by the laboratory. Uh, in some cases, the number of analytes has shifted, and we think we need really take a good look at what we should, what we should be sampling for, and just look at the whole program all over again. Standardized sample collection methods. We have some guidance in yeah, how these domestic wells should be sampled. We just want to make sure samples are being taken in a way that best represents <coughs> what people are drinking. Field oversight. This is a component of all our programs, and most of what we've described, the work is being conducted by Atlantic Ridge Field. And as part of our responsibility to provide oversight, federal agency, 